just very quickly. Okay. So um, here we are um, in quest of truth by Irene Coney Bear. Uh, I'll just overlap what we did last, uh, uh, the last few moments of last week. During his lifetime, my father was extremely skeptical with no belief in supernormal phenomena or of personal survival after death. So the retaining of consciousness after his demise came as a complete surprise and he was obliged to overhaul many of his previous convictions. He also regretted the destructive tendencies of the book referred to above. That's the origins of Christianity. And he was therefore anxious to establish communication with me and to prove his post-mortem existence. No doubt he influenced me subconsciously towards that end for a friend after some difficulty managed to persuade me to visit a trance medium. In those days, I had regarded spiritualism as pure charlatanry and knowing nothing whatever about it, I was as bigoted as anybody could be. <clears throat> Through her, I established contact with my father's personality. To begin with, it was extremely difficult to ex accept his claim to survival, but there was so much evidence that I was unable to refute quite apart from his extremely convincing scholarly characteristics, which none could imitate. He requested me to help him to prove his post-mortem existence to some of his Oxford colleagues, a request I could hardly refuse, difficult though I knew it would be. He also prompted me to take up mental mediumship. And in this study, I had the help and cooperation of a professional medium who did automatic writing, the late Mrs. Hester Dowden, a lady of the highest personal integrity, whose great psychic gifts were well known in London psychical circles. I owe her a debt of gratitude, which can never be repaid. However, I should mention that in the first place, I deemed it my duty to join the Society for Psychical Research, since quite a number of my father's former colleagues were on the committee, and doubtless they would be only too happy to help me to prove the survival of my father's personality. Hopefully I called to see the secretary, a most worthy and kind lady, who seeing that I was completely innocent of all the procedures that should accompany psychic research work, started straight away to indoctrinate me on the subject of fraud. By the time she had finished with me, I was beginning to suspect, I was beginning to su su suspect Mrs. Dowden, my friends, and above all myself. Fortunately, Mrs. Dowden's robust common sense gave me a proper sense of perspective. And it did not take long, to, did not take me very long to come to the conclusion that most of the members of the Psychical Research Society were chiefly concerned with a lot of learned balderdash and that the last thing they really wanted to do was to prove anything. I also found that my father's former colleagues were not nearly as enthusiastic as expected, as I expected them to be. Disillusioned, I transferred my allegiance to the British College of Psychic Science, to which institution I am indebted. 
with Mrs. Dowden's help, I carried on a private battle royale for two years with some of my father's friends. And one result of this work was the eventual conversion of Dr. MacDougall and Dr. Schiller, as well as other personal friends. In 1935, certain transatlantic experiments took place. Mrs. Dowden and myself in London and Dr. MacDougall and the trans medium Eileen Garrett at Duke University. In collaboration behind the scenes were my father and Duncan, the professor's son who had been killed in a plane accident three years back. An account of this quite remarkable experiment was published in my article in Light, that's a magazine, in 1952. With reference to Mrs. Garrett, whom I had never met, I was disappointed to find later that she could write a book showing so little discernment and understanding of the matters she had set herself to judge, though no doubt her motive to protect innocent lambs from the wolves can be appreciated, particularly in a country like America. But if Mrs. Garrett had known more about Eastern metaphysics at the time, I doubt she would have written so ill-naturedly about Maribaba, whom she had never even seen. So Light was the London Journal of the British College of Psychic Science and the sense and nonsense of prophecy, which she was just talking about. So, um, Gloria, could you unmute and uh, continue reading, please? Okay, thank you. During these two years of intensive psychic work, I developed under Mrs. Dowden's guidance the most unexpected psychic faculties, beginning with automatic writing and the Guija board, then clairvoyance, psychometry, and finally telekinesis, movement of objects without contact. The later phenomenon naturally created great interest. Mrs. Dowden was particularly thrilled for all her life. She hoped to get the traveler to move independently on the Ouija board and never succeeded. And now I had started to do it. Dr. McDougall insisted that I must put a sheet of glass between my hand and the Ouija board. But it is well known that glass has some ways of impeding phenomena for when Sir William Barrett put glass, put glass round Mrs. Dowden's head, she found that her hand would not move to do automatic writing. Dr. Schiller came to tea one afternoon and I was able to give him a demonstration in making the traveler more, move slightly on the Ouija board. He was most excited about it and on reaching home had a heart attack from which he mm -hmm. never really mm -hmm. recovered. His wife blamed me for causing it. Now that I had started, started telekinesis, my troubles really began. I quickly realized my fate would be sealed. For the moment objective phenomena starts, suspicion entered into the arena. In fact, it was beginning already for the then secretary of the London Society for Psychical Research, whom I regarded as a possible chevalier, since he was psychic himself, took me out to lunch and to my boundless indignation, started to insinuate that my dear little French maid might cheat. She had been cooperating at some of my sittings, but later on, one afternoon, when the traveler moved on aid on the Ouija board, she declared she saw a huge hand and envelope mine and pushed the quote, quote, traveler. This frightened her so much that she did not cooperate anymore. On that and some other occasions, I distinctly felt as if some kind of etheric 
substance was oozing out of the palm of my hand as I held it some 10 inches or so above the quote, quote, traveler. I wonder if photography might have shown an ectoplasmic road. One of, uh, note, I suppose throwing a handkerchief on the ground, then make it rise up stiff and straight by magnetizing it with one's hands is a part of the same telekinetic process. This act is, however, only acquired by considerable training in certain yoga practice. One of the saddest experiences was that some much loved Oxford boys who had been killed in the war begged me through automatic writing to put them in touch with the relations. But unfortunately, my efforts were indignantly repelled by her families, by their families. Eventually, I wrote a book on my psychic work and experiences as they seen were recording, but withdrew it from publication because Sir Oliver Lodge felt that the work was not quite suitable for the general public, since certain techniques were described that were not altogether suitable for novices to try. So the notes in question were given to Dr. Hereward Carrington for his American Institute of Psychic Research at Los Angeles. He maintained that in two years, I did more work than the average student does in 10. This was because I was psychic. All investigators should be psychic. After much persistence with recalcitrant professors aided by the invaluable help of Mrs. Dowden, I came to the conclusion that a part of the ego undoubtedly survived death and we had to leave it at that. There is no doubt that objective evidence is far more evidential than any amount of subjective evidence, but great materialization mediums are very rare and one does not get much opportunity to see them. However, in 1955, I had the good fortune to be present at the since science given by Mrs. Ellen Duncan of Edinburgh, who was one of the greatest British materialization mediums of her day. This most remarkable woman was short and very stout. Two women, two women and myself were present when she prepared for the science. We undressed her and then she put on a piece, one piece of black garment and set a chair in the corner of the room, which had a thin curtain drawn across it. I sat right up against the wall and was so near that I could have touched her through the curtain. That morning, I had asked my father mentally to be sure and be present at the scenes and that he must try to materialize himself. When the scenes started, we first heard a number of voices all talking together. Then Mrs. Duncan's guy said very distinctly that, quote, there was a gentleman present who had come to keep an appointment made by his daughter that morning, end quote. My father then emerged from the curtain. He was clothed from head to foot in white ectoplasmic substance, which also drapped his head. Only his face showed through. I stooped up and peered at him, trying to distinguish his features. I recognized his mustache, but his face was hardly recognizable. He kept on pointing to his mouth as if to indicate that he could not get his voice going. I was naturally very disappointed. Then my mother appeared wrapped in the same manner, but she was much more recognizable and she was able to whisper to me. But unfortunately, I could not hear what she said. Then she burst into tears, crying, quote, she cannot hear me, she cannot hear me, end quote. Then followed a number of figures who wanted to speak to various members in the audience, which consisted of about, about, about 20 people, they were of all shapes and sizes, and the little girl controlled, Peggy, was very much to the fore. 
The astonishing thing was to see the more or less solid figures dissolve and drop through the floor right before our, our, our own eyes. But some of them were able to go back behind the curtain. I have been told that the spirits when excited, find it hard to keep their form and just vanish. The most remarkable appearance, which, which I shall never forget, was that of a young girl. Though covered with the ectoplasm like the others, her face was rosy and radiant. Her eyes were bright and shining. It was undoubtedly a face of flesh and blood. She was so solid that she spoke to me, asked me to get out of her way as she wanted to pass between me and the wall and my chair had to be pulled back to allow her to pass. She then went right behind the last row to talk to her old parents who were now standing up, having fully recognized their daughter. She remained talking to her parents for quite a while. Mrs. Donka's guide, Meanwhile, calling her from behind the curtain that she must come back. So she walked slowly back all the time talking, opened the curtain, gave a last farewell and disappeared behind the curtain. Later, later her parents told me that she had passed over six months back and that there was no doubt whatever in their minds that they had seen and talked with her daughter. They also said that the likeness in her face was absolutely as it should be. It was a most moving experience and never again could I doubt that the departed spirit had at times the power to materialize in physical form. A day or two later, I went to Mrs. Downen and had a talk, had a talk with my father through her hand and complaining that he had made, quote, a poor shout of it, end quote. He excused himself saying that he was unable to wrap himself up, quote, properly in that stuff, end quote. In fact, he just could not manage it. Neither could he get his voice. From what I have been told by experienced investigators, some spirits are very successful and others are not. It appears that the spirit has to concentrate mentally on his form and to reproduce it as remembered by his relatives and friends. This needs a lot of practice so that first appearances are not always successful. One can just imagine the difficulties of holding one's thought and one's form and at the same time, when only having a limited interview, trying to say what one wants what one wants to say to one's often disbelieving friends and relations to say nothing. To say nothing of the detached investigators with no understanding of the difficulties involved. For example, one man who had spent a lifetime investigating materializations and who had attended innumerable sciences given by Mrs. Duncan told me how on one occasion, a spirit friend of his had materialized perfectly, but with no eyes. So he said to him, quote, you have forgotten your eyes, old chap, end quote. Quote, quote, oh, have I? And the next moment the spirit was all eyes and no body. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Gloria. Uh, Christina, could you unmute and continue? <coughs> sure. I am not going into the controversy relating to Mrs. Duncan having at times, like other materialization mediums, produced, quote, fraudulent phenomena, end quote. Readers interested can read Maurice Barna Barbanel's book, The Trial of Helen Duncan. Is not physical phenomena always accompanied by controversy? If I remember rightly, Madame Blavatsky wrote in The Veil of Isis that materializations were the work of mischievous entities. That certainly could explain much. One can just imagine the hordes of mischievous entities buzzing around the headquarters of the various psychical research societies of the academic type 
taking advantage of members' weak points, such as the scientific superiority complex, or worse still, the Frank complex, to disrupt and confuse proceedings in something of the same manner as to the hideous entities overshadowing lunatic asylums. It was always amazed, it has always amazed me the way members of these societies are apt to imagine that they are competent to investigate when they do not even understand the elementary principles of man's occult constitution, or even know the part that the medium's astral body may play. I will now relate another experience. End of August, 1934, I went to Italy with Mrs. Dowd. We were enjoying a good holiday at Torre del Bonaco, Bonaco at Lake Garda, on Lake Garda. One night, the moon was so bright that it kept me half awake as it shone through the aperture of the wooden shutters. When I suddenly became aware that someone was in the room who seemed to be pinching me, I told myself that I must be dreaming and took no notice. But the groping hands continued till I could stand it no longer. I sat up in bed and looked around. I saw an elderly female figure clad in an old fashioned nightgown with frills round the neck. I immediately thought it must be Mrs. Dowden. Perhaps she was ill and needed me. I then realized that the figure was not in the least like Mrs. Dowden, neither did she wear such a nightgown. I spoke to it several times, but it took no notice and continued to run its hands over my body, my arms and body, as though it was searching for something that I had concealed. This was most unpleasant. The room was dark except for the bright shaft of light that fell across the middle of the bed, and though I could see the face of the person, I could not distinguish the features. Suddenly, I became frightened, thinking perhaps that a thief was in the room disguised as an old lady. I jumped out of bed. Then it tried to put its arms around me. I pushed it away and noticed that it offered no resistance and seemed to fall away feebly as if it had little substance. Then the figure scuttled to the floor, its feet not touching the ground, and it disappeared. By now, I should have realized that it was only a ghost, but I had completely lost my nerve. I dashed to the window, threw the shutters wide open, screaming, Huomo, huomo, nella mia camera. Man, man, in my room. Below, people were sitting around tables enjoying the beautiful night. The proprietor and another woman rushed up to my room to find a disheveled and half-demented Englishwoman clad only in her nightgown. They assured me that no one could have possibly entered the staircase leading up to my room and that obviously I'd, I had had a nightmare. I was then escorted to Mrs. Dowden's room on hearing my, Mrs. Dowden's room. On hearing my story, she remarked, it must have been your mother. Then of course I knew since it was the kind of old fashioned nightgown that she wore. At that time, my mother was in London and not too pleased over my holiday with Mrs. Dowden. The next morning I had a sitting and my father explained the situation to Mrs. Dowden as follows. Irene had a visitation from her mother's thoughts. She was extremely suspicious at present, chiefly because you and Irene are together. In Irene's state of half sleep, she gathered not only a message from her mother, but a televismic impression, probing and feeling her to discover what the position really was. So it happened that my father had warned me that she would not live another six months. So televismic, I guess, is the author's coined word. And that there was danger of her making an alteration in her will, not altogether in my interests. This is exactly what happened. And I discovered after her will, after her death, by her will, that she had made the alterations just when I was in Italy with Mrs. Dowden. I was so feared that I might find out about it from my, I was so feared that I might find out about it from my father. In spite of the mass of circumstantial evidence and my father put up a brilliant defense and certainly succeeded in proving his post-mortem survival, survival, not only to me, but to others, I remained very dissatisfied for I could not uncritically accept mediumistic communications at their face value, especially in the hurried work of professional mediums where one's time is strictly limited and circumscribed. Sri Aurobindo has provided some answers to our questions in his work, The Life Divine. 
where he has given us some explanations so far as anything can be explained about afterlife conditions. It does seem that there are many different aspects to the personality. To quote Aurobindo, this ghost, which is mistakenly called the spirit, is sometimes a vital formation reproducing the man's characteristics, his surface life's mannerisms, sometimes a subtle physical prolongation of the surface form of the mind shell. At best, it is a sheath of the life personality which still remains in the front for some time after the departure of the body. These remarks help me to understand the disappointments that come when it applies to careful corroboration of facts, even though there was much that I could recognize and which was completely beyond dispute, at the same time, there was always so much lacking. I am sure that the best evidence of afterlife can only be obtained by those who are fortunate enough to be able to visit the other world in their astral bodies, but such people are rare and do not lend themselves for experimental, and for experimental work in laboratories. For those who want the truth and nothing but the truth, and we are not willing and are not willing to accept just what they may want to believe, we again turn to Aurobindo. Apart, quote, apart from these confusions, born of an afterlife contact with discarded phantoms or remnants of the sheath of the personality, the difficulty is due to our ignorance of the subliminal parts of our nature and the forms and powers of the conscious being or purusha, which presides over their actions. Owing to this inexperience, we can easily mistake something of the inner mind or vital self for the psyche. For as being is one yet multiple, so also the same law prevails in ourselves and our members. The spirit, the purusha, is one, but it adapts itself uh, to the formations of nature. Over each grade of our being, a power of the spirit presides. We have within us and dis discover when we go deep enough inwards, a mind self, a life self, a physical self. There is a being of mind, a mental purusha, expressing something of itself in the instincts, habits, and formulated activities of our physical nature. These beings are part selves of the self in us, are powers of the spirit, and therefore not limited by their temporary expression. For what is thus formulated is only a fragment of its possibilities." End quote. Thanks, uh, Christina. Marianne, could you unmute and continue? Yeah. As a student investigator and a medium all at the same time, I had rather an unusual position, but I tried always to remain as detached as possible, seeking only the evidence that mattered. I checked up all Mrs. Dowden's scripts, all my own, and also all sittings with other mediums, also my own sittings with my friends and when alone with myself. In this manner, I came to the conclusion that corroborative evidence between ourselves and the spirits was very difficult and that one should not expect to average more than 50-50 in results. Only a mechanical medium eliminating the subconscious mind of both medium and sitter could really satisfy our requirements, and even then perhaps only up to a point. Such an instrument was found in the David Wilson machine invented before the First World War. I remember considerable interest was aroused at the time, but I believe the machine was not perfected for various reasons. It really looked as if the powers that be did not wish us to have a telephone between the two worlds. Details of this machine were published at that time in Light, also in the Occult Review. My friend, the Honorable Ralph Shirley, former senior partner of Hutchinson's publishers, told me a story of how during the war, the machine was confiscated by Scotland Yard because it was listen, ask, show me the, it was getting messages from dead Germans. I understand that the inventor of this machine, not being a spiritualist, was embarrassed to such an extent that he destroyed it. And so far as I know, no one else has been able to put it together. 
As I had no acquaintance with the teachings of the occult schools, I knew, like most investigators in psychic research, nothing about the esoteric constitution of man. Yet the first step for students is to learn something of the teachings of these schools so that many puzzling aspects of psychic phenomena may be more easily explained. Not that the knowledge of these schools is in any way infallible, but they know much more than ordinary inquirers about the hidden aspects of man's subtle bodies, also thought forms. And that refers to thought form C Appendix 5. Unwillingness to learn from all directions is one of the reasons why so little progress has been made in this century on this subject, especially by those whose intellect is conditioned by scientific branches of learning, such as in the parapsychological departments of universities. It has always surprised me that those in search of evidence for personal survival do not begin with the study and practice of the supernormal faculties of man. The French, with their mental clarity and capacity for following out a logical system of thought to a realistic conclusion, unhampered to the same extent by want of intellectual honesty, as is sometimes the case with their American hmm. and British colleagues, did some very remarkable work at the beginning of this century, which so far as I know, has not been continued. Charles Flotselin, a fearless investigator of the unknown, wrote a book, L'Ame Humaine, which was published in Paris in 1918. This work was before its time, but is now of considerable importance to the psychologist. The author sought to prove the objective reality of the mind insofar as its objective status could be proved as in photography and clinical work. He began first of all by proving the objective reality of the quote, double, that is the astral body of the subject, or in other words, the theory of bilocation. From this hypothesis, he went on to prove the existence of other finer ethereal bodies. Lancelin, in his researches, by means of experimental studies in psychophysiology, sought to obtain data on the substance and properties of the mind, its organic biology, its anatomy, its material elements, and general chemical and physical properties. In this work, he was assisted by Madame Lambert, a most remarkable sensitive, whose daring self-sacrifice for the sake of science puts her on the level of the greatest explorers into the unknown spheres of existence. She allowed Lancelin to magnetize her into her different bodies or forms, pushing her ever higher into the realms of super consciousness. While in these trance-like conditions, she was able to describe to Lancelin what she saw. It seemed that differently formed lights symbolically marked each new ascent into a higher sphere. Sometimes she would be almost blinded by the brilliance of the white light. Then she would become terribly afraid and implore Lancelin to wake her up and bring her back to normal consciousness. For she was always in great fear that during these expeditions to the higher levels of the spirit, she might be unable to descend again to her normal physical vehicle, her body. Lancelin's work therefore was of an exceedingly dangerous nature, for he had made the slightest mistake, for had he made the slightest mistake, he could have killed her. 
the silver cord attaching the subject to her various bodies might have become ruptured in the process. For as we know, death is always caused by the breaking of the cord that keeps the ego and the various bodies en rapport with one another. Such hazardous and difficult work had never before been tried, and Lancelin would sometimes find it exceedingly hard to pull her down to earth. For once the spirit has risen so high, it is always loath to come down again to its physical habitat. On one occasion, Lancelin asked Madame Lambert what would happen to her should he fail to reintegrate and reconstitute her back into her normal vehicle and home, the physical body. She replied that should the spirit refuse to return to its body, the physical vehicle would be bereft of control by the ego and would take on the appearance of an idiot and eventually die. In other words, she would be unable to get back into her body. In these excursions, she seems sometimes to have gone to the very limit. For when urged to go still farther, she would cry, Mais il n'y a à plus rien, puisque nous sommes au bout de l'âme. But there, which in parentheses is, but there is no more anything. We have come to the end of the soul. On other occasions, she would say that there was rien que esprit nothing but spirit. Had she, like the initiates, traversed to the regions where pure spirit, freed from all material properties, began? I have touched on the French investigators' amazing experiments because Madame Lambert's remarks concerning the fate of her body and her fear of the spirit's refusal to come down again back into it are in some manner anal anal analogous to the psychology of the mus. And there's an asterisk. See appendix. Oh, must see <laughs> appendix 10. It would be interesting to know how far Madame Lambert did progress along the path with its 49 stages of illumination. Mayor Baba has stated, that most pilgrims traverse the way unconsciously. And when a master needs a disciple for practical daily work, he will draw him unconsciously through the various planes of spiritual existence. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, uh, Miguel, could you unmute and continue, please? Well, it is probably impossible for anyone to repeat the experimental work of Lancelin. It should not be difficult to make a special study of astral projection, like Hector Durbier <coughs> in his remarkable work, Fantôme de Vivants, also published in Paris about the same time as La May Humaine. In this book, Durbier gave accounts of some experiments and shows photographs of Madame Lambert's astral body. He will get her to sit her physical body in a chair and then walk around the room in her astral body. Why cannot serious students of psychic research do work along these lines if they want objective proof? There must be many who can travel in the astral body, since we all do in, do in, our, in our sleep state. Then again, there is the ability of the body to vanish physically, sometimes voluntarily and sometimes involuntarily. But such cases are very rare, and there will be little scope for investigation in the West. We have the well-known story of Apollonius of Tiana, a very high initiate who lived with Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. 
when Howlett before his judges, his, his judges, he simply rose up in the air and disappeared to be seen later several hundred miles from the scene. Legends have recorded such disappearances and there are also present day stories and there must be many mysterious disappearances not accounted for by the police because of their occult nature. I always remember reading about the unfortunate London actioneer who left his suburban home one morning in a hurry to catch his train. As he had forgotten his umbrella, the maid ran after him with it. When she got to the corner of the street, he had vanished. But she heard his voice above her head screaming. Oh, oh that, um, that asterisk is interesting. I'll read it, even though it's out of... Uh, yes, the church black ended the name of Apollonius as they did not want to have any rivals <laughs> to Jesus. Uh, Oops. Oh, sorry. Uh, hang on a second. We hit a, the wrong key. So what the, the lady was hearing about her head, in quotes, put me down, you devils, pull me down, you devils, you know the quote. Was he captured by Saucerians? I do not suppose his family sought psychic means to ascertain what had happened to him. The friend I mentioned in the appendix on thought forms also had two experiences in which she was transported physically, not astrally. She told me how once when she went for a long walk, she was feeling tired and wished she was already at the top of the hill she wanted to climb. The next moment, she was there. Beyond feeling a bit Breathless and very astonished, she did not notice anything peculiar. She told me that she did not like to tell people about these experiences as they would not believe her. But she did later meet a man who told her of similar experiences. With regard to ordinary astral traveling, it is known in the East that when an initiate wishes to withdraw from his physical vehicle and inside quotes travel, he will cover his head for the time being and become motionless. There is an esoteric tradition stating that Jesus showed himself in 12 different places at once. And we all know the story of the mysterious Comte the Saint Germain, who appeared simultaneously at six of the gates of Paris. There are also recorded instances of the phenomenon of by location in the lives of the saints. But then again, astral traveling is not the prerogative of the initiates. And it is common knowledge that ordinary mortals can inside, inside quotes travel. I have reason to believe that sensitives who can, in say quotes, travel at will are sometimes employed by the police, as was in the case of Alice, the subject of Arthur Sprays, the famous healer and hyp hypnotist, a shoemaker of Bexil on Sea. I personally knew a Spray, also Alice. She was such an expert that she used to inconvenience people by following them about, inside quotes. Inconvenience, sorry, let me say that word again, or the phrase again. She was such an expert that she used to inconvenience people by, inside quotes, following them about. On the occasion, the spray came up to the London flat to give me some treatment. She told me that Alice will not know anything about it, 
because she was away on a holiday. It subsequently turned out that Alice took it into her head to visit London too, in her astral body. She was able to describe the contents of the flat, what we were doing and what we were talking about. Could one have better proof of by location than that? If only the average psychiatrist understood a little more about the phenomenon of by location and realized that it is one of the natural facts, how much needless mental agony might be saved on the part of patients who have had as I quote, out of the body experiences and were consequently much frightened just because they did not understand. I remember a hospital nurse came to see me much worried about herself because one night she had awakened to find two of herself in the bed. Okay. It is fortunate that she did not tell a doctor and that I was able to reassure her as to the condition. Mr. Wright, thanks to his knowledge on this subject, was able to save patients who otherwise will have imagined themselves to be mental. Once when paying a weekend visit to Dr. McDowell, I was trying to explain the mechanics and techniques of astral projection. His son, who had been listening intently, took me aside after the conversation. He confessed that he too had, as I quotes, out of the body experiences and had been amazed and frightened to find himself walking around the room while his body lay on his bed. He could not understand it and feared that he was mad and was afraid to tell his father. Yet Dr. McDowell was one of the greatest living psychologists at that time. I helped to alter his former outlook by lending him books on the subject. And he promised me that after his retirement from his directorship at Duke, should they appoint him a commissioner of the Lunacy Board, he will look into the subject. I had so much at heart by encouraging specialists to study occult literature and the esoteric constitution of man before they diagnosed mental diseases. Unfortunately, for the advancement of our knowledge in these matters, Dr. McDowell died and all my hopes and aspirations in that direction die with him. Scientists fear to investigate supernormal phenomena because they are associated with magic and witchcraft. And so the subject is not respectable. Yet these facts had been known from time immemorial. In Spain, there is a certain cave in which frescoes reputed to be 10,000 years old, depict witches on their flying broomsticks. There are also books written about astral projection, one of the best being astral projection. Dr. Carrington wrote to me that the book did not get any reviews, quote, because of its horrific implications, end quote. One has only to read accounts of famous mediums in the Encyclopedia of Psychic Science to know the trials and tribulations they will go through in face of the coercy and dishonesty of investigators willing to believe the evidence on their senses, of their senses. 
the ordeals and difficulties of D.D. Home, the most marvelous physical medium of his time, are well worth reading. I remember my old friend, Dr. Francis Woods, a distinguished medical practitioner of Harley, St. London, telling me how he, along with Lord Crawford and others, so home float out through a window 70 feet above the ground and re-entered the same room by another window seven feet away. Sir William Crookes recorded in the Quarterly Journal of Science, January 1874, inside quotes on three separate occasions I have seen home raised completely from the floor of the room. There are at least a hundred recorded instances of home rising from the ground in the presence of as many separate persons, etc. In the quote, such levitation phenomena are very well are very rare in the West, but a matter of fairly common knowledge in the East. In those days, there were few brave pioneers of the caliber of Sir William Crookes Richard and Sir Oliver Lodge. Regarding my own work in 1934, I found there there were few chevaliers and pure et sans reproche. Here, here's a good place to uh, stop and pick up next week. Do you guys have much discussion about this? We can have all the discussion we want. Aha. Uh -huh. I'd like to know what people think about everything that they just read here.